Welcome back as we continue to follow the fallout from the Silicon Valley bank failure. We're also bringing you updates on Canadian angles to the story. For more on what we know so far, we're joined by BNM Bloomberg's Kamuta Ramanathan. Hi, Kamuta. Hi there. Of course, Paul, we saw on Friday how that market fear around a potential contagion already started to impact the TSX as well as its North American peers. Really interesting today, we can see metals, including gold and silver, really moving as investors don't really know where to focus. Look at Oceana Gold, for instance, first majestic silver in terms of principal contributors to the TSX. Performance-wise today, we're really seeing they're continuing to benefit from those gains early on. Adding to that, information technology, as you can imagine, principal laggard on the TSX early on in the morning. But we're still waiting to see exactly what this means for the marketplace, John. I mean, what do you see so far? Well, it's interesting because the, the, on the metals in particular, the call is really towards the U.S. Do, uh, dollar. I mean, let's face it, the U.S. dollar uh, rates have been going higher, has really sucked the oxygen out of Absolutely. the room for all the commodities and everything else. Everyone's been waiting for a break in this right. thing to sort of get onto the metals and gold in particular. You got it in this last couple of days because <laughs> suddenly now we, the bets went from, what I was telling you, Paul, earlier, about what, 50% they go half a point next week, the Fed, to now a chance that they don't move at all. So people are starting to factor in maybe the rate increases are coming to an end, starting to roll over. If they do, okay, the U.S. dollar starts to come under pressure. U.S. dollar comes under pressure. Markets just love to leap ahead watch those higher metals. So you said gold in particular, because right. that's less economically sensitive. I mean, copper and, and oil to degree are going to be determined what's on in global markets and global growth. But these ones, so I think that's exactly it. So yeah, we saw gold move $80 in the past three days, I think. What would it take in this situation, John, for the U.S. dollar to come under sustained pressure? Well, it has been, it started last year a little, even though they hadn't been cutting rates. And, you know, we look at the DXY, has come from 112, came down to 102. So it's had a pretty sharp pullback. I think this accelerated it a little bit more and just sends money into the other categories. Like I say, right. this has been a, a sort of held back a lot of other asset classes and particularly resources and metals. And I think it's uh, maybe a more of a tailwind. And, and just to add to that, the, the psychological impairment that so many investors have right now, given that they're already concerned about the Fed's next move, this news today is just one more thing that precipitates change in terms of the market movements that we're seeing. Just look at information tech technology. Just look at TSX financials. That's why analysts are coming out this morning talking about how this is not a Canadian problem thus far. We're still waiting to hear if there is any more fallout, what that could mean in terms of those with limited exposure. Just to give you a sense, National Bank issued a report this morning talking about banks, the big ones, Bank of Nova Scotia, BMO, Royal Bank and TD. And they wanted to qualify everything, saying that we see a small exposure. The one area that they do see sort of a caveat is in terms of that overall long-term loan growth for BMO in particular, because they talk about, given that they have, I think, less than a 10% exposure with their loan books, this could be something that impacts the overall assessment of the market pace. But again, this is not a tomorrow story. This is a few quarters down the road. Kind John, of John, are there buying opportunities being unearthed in the Canadian bank stocks? TD Bank down 3% today. Royal Bank down 2%. Bank of Montreal down 3.5% today alone. Yeah, if you weren't, if you didn't own the banks, and we're underway now, and I'm sort of looking at picking some of those names up right now because I don't see the contagion risk there. But, you know, having said that, I mean, there are some headwinds ahead for them. One is, you know, the, the, the shape of the yield curve in particular. So they always borrow short, lend right. long. That's almost running at a net. That is running at a negative spread right now. That's not good. You mentioned loan growth. Loan growth is going to slow down. I mean, the Fed's whole purpose is to slow down the economy, effectively put us into a recession, although they won't say that. How is that good for, you know, loans, loan provisioning, capital markets activities and other things like that? So you got a few things ahead for the banks, but, you know, they're still a safe play. They're well capitalized. They've got a decent yield. So there, there are worse places to hide. So like I say, I've been underweight, but I'd be more inclined to be a buyer. Uh, Why don't we finish with the big name tech stocks? You referenced that uh, there may be some, uh, they may be, they may become a source of funding or they may even take over some of the smaller distressed players. Fortress balance sheet, cash rules a day in these sorts of downturns. And, and one thing you know is the major players, they haven't been lended, uh, they haven't really levered up or anything like that. They're sitting on great balance sheets, massive cash, and they generate a lot of cash in this environment. That's an asset. You can go away and sort of pick at, you know, the competitors and the smaller players that are suddenly in need of financing but can't find it because their typical channels, the smaller banks, have all closed on them. 
John Zechner, thank you a great deal for this. Yeah. Kamuta Ramanathan, thanks as well. U.S. government bond yields plunged yesterday. Investors were apparently looking for a safe haven amid fears over the stability of the financial system. And there was even talk that the Fed might hold off from an interest rate increase at its next meeting. However, we have seen those bond yields moving back up again, i.e. some investors are getting out of bonds and uh, are partners at Bloomberg are reporting that investors are betting that a Fed increase is coming. We're joined now by Quinty Crosby, Chief Global Strategist at LPL Financial. Thanks very much for coming on the show. And Derek Tang, CEO and co-founder of LH Meyer Monetary Policy Analytics. It's great to have you here. Uh, Quincy, could I start with you? Seems to be a U-turn here. Now a lot of investors thinking, yeah, we will get another Fed increase. Yeah, you know, this is something, I mean, the Fed is certainly meeting. They're in the blackout period, uh, but of course they're meeting. And the question I think for the Fed, we think for the Fed is, if they were to pause, would it in fact create more uncertainty in the market hmm. regarding how the Fed sees the, the, uh, the underlying problem with the regional banks? Another thing is they've been given in many ways a pass right now because of that CPI report that you that you mentioned. Uh, it is basically in line with consensus estimates. And we saw that the market upon in the futures market continued to increase because the market basically said, OK, no big surprises, not hotter than we had expected. So. The market right now, the futures market, is looking at a probability of a 25 basis point hike uh, on March 22nd unless the regional issue, regional bank issue, intensifies. That's interesting, Derek. Um, uh, that's a fascinating point that Quincy made, that if the Fed was to hold off from an interest rate increase, it could have an unintended effect. It wouldn't reassure the market. It would make them think, oh, what's the Fed afraid of here? Absolutely. I mean, the Fed is encountering a situation where it might have had to choose between financial stability and price stability. And the interventions this weekend are really meant to solve the financial stability side of things. But the price stability question is very much in play. Uh, you know, we had a 50 basis point hike penciled in before uh, the events of this weekend um, due to Powell's testimony. And we've downgraded that to 25 basis points. But for the time being, it's really steady as she goes with the tightening campaign because this inflation problem is so intractable. Quincy, um, you, as of this morning anyway, you thought the market, the broad market was in oversold territory, the broad equity market. Tell us what you mean by that. And maybe we'll put up a one year chart for the S&P 500. Well, yeah, I mean, there are many metrics that are looked at and, 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 and um, the cumulative effect of overbought, oversold. The technicians look at this. But nonetheless, those of us who look at the fundamentals of the market also follow what the technicians say. And they over, overwhelmingly have said we have moved towards, quote unquote, an oversold uh, scenario underpinning for the market. The reason that's important is very often when you are in oversold territory or overbought, you can keep going in that direction. However, the market, as you can see, the catalyst, no blow up overnight with one of the another regional bank. Mm -hmm. uh, also, the CPI report helped to some degree. And the, the oversold condition was allowed to work its way out and into the market climbing higher. Of course, the paradox, Quincy, here, isn't it? The, the U.S. economy seems to be doing pretty well. I mean, there, there aren't overt signs of a recession or a slowdown yet. No, uh, there aren't. But the fact is you cannot look at the yield curve uh, and see two inverted yield curves along the, along the, um, along the curve oh. and just say, well, it doesn't matter. It's different this time. They have actually become more inverted. And the question is, what, what is the Treasury market seeing uh, in terms of a potential recession? 
we're going to have one at some point. The question has been, what kind? Is it going to be mild? Is it going to be short? That's the big question for the market right now. Derek, you have a, a, a fascinating thought here that the Fed posture, the Fed interest rate policy might be too aggressive for financial stability, but not tight enough for price stability. So are they just kind of just caught in the middle here? Yes, there are some very difficult trade-offs they might have to make. You know, this is an academic idea that's really um, surfaced in recent months and been presented to former Vice Chair Brainerd and President Williams, for example, of the New York Fed, that they're past the point of uh, they're past the point of really fomenting you know, financial instability, but they're not quite there in terms of doing enough to get inflation down. Um, so there's this really difficult trade-off, and you know when push comes to shove, it's difficult to see what they would choose. Um, as I mentioned, the interventions this weekend are meant to really shore up the financial stability side to create more policy space so that they can continue hiking. Uh, but whether that that is going to work really remains to be seen. And so, uh, you know, we're taking it day by day, just like the Fed mm -hmm. is. And you know, it really will come down to the wire next week with the Fed meeting. Quincy, could we just? I was reading the Wall Street Journal today. Of course, it's no fan of President Biden, but they are critical in an editorial of of this decision to bail out or to refund or reimburse um, uninsured depositors in Silicon Valley Bank. The Wall Street Journal perhaps a bit of mischief here, claims it's after tech entrepreneurs who are big Democratic donors howled in pain. Um, but is, is Mr. Biden setting an unfortunate, unfortunate pre precedent here? Well, it's difficult because if we see, I mean, the whole goal was to keep the other banks intact and not have a run on the banks. When you have panic and fear, that's contagion. Mm -hmm. You will have uh, depositors insured and not insured lining up across the country. That is a very negative headline. Uh, what I think the White House wanted to do was to try to alleviate stress. And I, apparently, at least this morning, a little bit is seeping into the market of, of, of no more, how do I say this, runs on, on, on the bank, that fear has uh, dissipated somewhat. The question really is, mm -hmm. can they do that if we do see a run on the other retail banks and uh, the uninsured, uh, what they're depending on what the comments out of the White House. There certainly is not enough money to cover another run on a number of banks, even this week or next week, then that's the question. And that could actually, in and of itself, cause a run on the banks, by the way. Sorry, give us that last thought. Um, what could, well, what, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I'm so sorry. Well, if you're a, 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 a depositor and you are not uh, uh, insured, you're above 250,000 US dollars, perhaps you're wondering, well, maybe they're not going to be able to do it if my bank actually come, runs into uh, a problem and the depositors come in, the, the insured come in and say, I want my money out. And I go in, is the government actually going to be able to stay with that promise of taking care of all depositors. That is lurking in the headlines right now. It's hovering over the market. And that's where you get contagion, when fear and panic set in. So I think the president, I don't want to take political sides, was trying to alleviate that concern mm -hmm. amongst depositors. So they stayed home. Yeah. They stayed home and just mm -hmm. calmed down. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, nothing to fear but fear itself, but emotion, obviously, is... Uh, yes. Yeah, exactly. Um, we're almost out of time and uh, really happy to have you guys uh, join us today. Um, I mean, what a day as well. Derek, could you give me a quick thought here? The Wall Street Journal again is saying that Washington is offering to indemnify banks if they made bad interest rate portfolio choices, a.k.a. loaded up on long-term bonds. Um, are they doing that as well? Are they giving an out to banks who just got it wrong and, and, uh, and took risks on interest rates? Well, the Fed has determined, along with other regulators, that the uh, systemic risks exist. And so I think we're past the point of um, really worrying more about the moral hazard side of things. Um, it is true that the, this intervention, at least for the first year, uh, will mean that some of the interest rate risk will be um, 
taken away from banks and put on the Fed's balance sheet for the time being. Uh, but this is all in the interest of keeping the financial system stable. And the hope is that you, uh, in the uh, process of um, in the process of solving this issue, this will happen in a more gradual process than coming as a big shock. We'll have to jump. Guys, thank you very much indeed for joining us today. Okay, we've got a steep sell-off on our hands as we have started the Wednesday trading session. I want to bring in one of our regular guests uh, to make sense of these markets, Anastasia Amoroso. She's Chief Investment Strategist at iCapital Investors. Great to have you with us, Anastasia. And uh, as we've been talking about all morning long, uh, we had shifted, it seemed like, from the worries within the U.S. banking system following the collapse to Silicon Valley Bank to now a story of unease within the broader global financial banking world, uh, as evidenced by really just the headline this morning on Credit Suisse that their largest investor was not hungry to invest more in the business. What does that tell you about the sensitivity in the markets right now? Yeah, I think this is a market that's extremely sensitive to any sort of negative headline. And the one that we got uh, from the Saudi National Bank was a bad one for Credit Suisse this morning. But what I will say, John, is if you look at the health of the overall European banking sector, it actually looks better than what we see in the U.S., and especially for regional banks. For example, if you look at some of the uh, capital ratios, the common equity tier one capital ratio is higher in Europe than it is in the United States. The average is 14 for some of those banks, 14% versus 12% for U.S. large banks and 10% for regional banks. So a much better capital position. You also have the liquidity coverage ratio, which is supposed to be measuring liquidity on hand to stomach 30 days worth of outflows. And those ratios are looking much better for the European banks versus U.S. regionals as well. So I think the market wants to paint every single bank with one single brush. And today, the lightning rod for that was Credit Suisse. But I don't quite think that's a fair spillover reaction to the European banks. Having said that, despite the better financial health of those banks, I think what the market is reacting to is all the banks everywhere are facing the same set of issues, which is depositors have other ways to generate income on their deposits, and they're taking that, those money out of the bank. Uh, and, it, and that rises the funding cost for these banks. It, re, it decreases the net interest margin. And by the way, the bond holdings that these banks have are now hit with the uh, negative mark to market due to rising rates. So that's sort of the negative feedback loop that somehow the regulators need to break if they are to get back to the core mission here, which is fighting inflation. Well, what's amazing to me is just the speed at which we process information and demand information today, Anastasia. And in the same way that there seemed to be a little bit of ease in the market yesterday or comfort, I guess, in the market yesterday, that maybe we were going to see a situation where not only the U.S. was there to backstop depositors uh, stateside, but also that the Fed was maybe going to get on board with the idea that more rate hikes might cause more problems than not. Um, and it almost feels to me like these markets, while they're down right now, might move in the other direction if you are very quickly given a reason to think that the worst case scenario is not going to materialize. Uh, this could very well be, John, and I think this is going to be a very long week ahead as we wait towards the Fed um, you know, meeting next week. Look, what the market were reacting to yesterday is a little bit of a relief saying, look, there is a backstop and maybe the Fed is not going to hike quite as much. But as we kind of understand what the backstop was, first of all, the backstop did not explicitly ensure all the depositors in the United States, you know, maybe implicitly, but not explicitly. And that's what we're waking up to this morning. And the backstop that the U.S. government provided also did not ensure against losses for equity and bondholders in some of these banks. So there is still a risk uh, there that needs to be assessed. And again, that's, you know, that's kind of the realization. Also, you know, this is not a one day event. And I think the reason why the Fed should treat this as a cause for pause is because we're not talking about a small sliver of, you know, let's say risky crypto trades that have gone wrong. 
We're talking about the global banking system that is feeling some pressure and feeling some strain. So the benefit of hiking 25 basis points is probably not that great in the overall fight against inflation when you have the potential financial turmoil that is much more paramount to address. I've been thinking about that considering the indirect or even direct liquidity boost that we saw over the weekend versus, I don't know, whatever um, uh, steps you're taking to, to curb some of that with a single 25 basis point hike to your earlier point. But, you know, earlier in the program, we were also talking about the flip flop in rates in the early 70s and the challenges that every environment can create. Now, in this environment, we still have the inflation challenge. And to your point about maybe pausing, I mean, I guess the question would be if the central bank powered through with more rate hikes, which some are still very concerned about the inflationary story, although the, the data this morning maybe gives them a reason to pause. But I guess, you know, if, if, we, if, if the Fed were to look back at past rate hike cycles and what complicating factors arise from up and down and all around in the middle of one of those cycles. Is that the kind of thing that they now have to think about trying to avoid? Look, of course, they want to go back and forth and flip flop on this, but maybe that's what the market environment and the data requires. And John, what we're seeing right now happen with the banking sector is actually deflationary. As a result of all of these developments, you're very likely to have banks that tighten lending standards and they pull back on lending. So if lending growth was 7-8% last year, it's likely to be, you know, was expected to be 2 or 3% this year. It might not even happen at all this year. So I think the Fed has to consider that and say, again, the cost of pausing here to assess the situation and assess any sort of variable lags here, that might be worthwhile. And look, if they manage to stabilize the situation and, you know, fast forward a month or two from now, these bank shares are trading much better, then they can go back to the inflation fight and they can continue the rate hiking cycle. But I think at this very moment, what's happened is a deflationary event in the banking sector, and they have to acknowledge that. That's a really helpful point. Before I let you get back to it, Anastasia, I always like to get your broader view on where to invest or think about investing, given the macro situation. Uh, what would be your message to our audience this morning? Right. So the strategy we've obviously been sticking with is half defensive, half opportunistic, you know, depending on your exact asset allocation. So I would stick with that. But more timely, given the dislocation that we're seeing in the markets, I mentioned the strong capital positions of large uh, cap banks in the United States and maybe even some European banks. I don't know if you necessarily need to go into the equity part of that equation, but if you can look at some of the preferreds of these high quality banks, if you look at some of the investment grade corporate bonds of these banks that spreads have wind out, and I'm not talking about regionals, I think that's an interesting opportunity for investors. They can get you close to 6% yield to worst at this point. So that's more in the defensive bucket. But then in the opportunistic bucket, one interesting development, John, is that while financials have been selling off, technology stocks, the NASDAQ, has actually been behaving better and is down pre-market today. But if you think about it, if the Fed is in fact done with its rate hiking cycle and the ECB is close to that, then the valuation drag that these tech companies have been seeing might be the thing of the past. So I would actually look opportunistically to be adding to tech on a pullback. Very interesting. And, and to your point about the banks, I mean, you immediately saw some of the analysts jump in after the sell-off with the U.S. players to suggest maybe there is an opportunity there as well. Okay, well, that's what makes a market. We'll be watching very closely. Anastasia, thanks for your time. The collapse of Silicon Valley Bank in the U.S. happened quickly. Concern around the bank's stability spread fast on social media, and customers rushed to pull money out. More than $40 billion in just one day. So what can we learn about this modern run on the bank? Let's bring in Jim Anderson, social media lead at Glasswing Ventures. Jim, thanks so much for joining us. Good to be here. So, Jim, how much of a role do you think social media really played in the speed of this bank run? Yeah, Jacqueline, I think first and foremost, we need to remember this is a banking story, right? The, the management and executives of Silicon Valley Bank took some significant interest rate risks. They didn't hedge that, and they basically precipitated a crisis, really, in the entire banking sector. 
Social media was an accelerant, but think about it. Whatever panic was set off by social media or accelerated by social media was pretty justified. I, I, I had money in the bank, in Silicon Valley Bank. They were our, our banker. Um, so, you know, it would have been irresponsible to not react once you realize the kinds of bets they took. And so it's, in my mind, the focus on social media is a little bit of a misplaced focus. I think the panic in that particular case was justified uh, given the decisions they were making and, and social media just accelerated it. Do you think uh, social media in this, you know, age of digital banking can be sort of a, an equalizer? Because otherwise, you know, if you think of a traditional run on the bank, you'd have to have seen the lineup outside the bank to know that you should be getting in it. Um, so do you think that this maybe levels the playing field a little bit for people? In some ways, it does. I, 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 the phrase democratization is, I think, a bit overused. But in the, this particular instance, you're exactly right. How were you going to know there was a run on the bank if you didn't find out about it on, on Twitter? Now, there are definitely some negative effects, uh, side effects of that, because there are situations you can imagine, and we've had them historically, where panics set in that weren't really grounded in reality. It was just the contagion that took over. And I don't think any of us want to see a world where whatever we see on Twitter causes panicked behavior, and then it just accelerates and runs away from there. Mm -hmm. But I do think it's important to distinguish between, you know, legitimate uh, panic and concern and, and then the the sort of unjustified concern. How we tease those two things apart, I think, is a really interesting question. Yeah, it, it is interesting because when we think about social media influencers, you might think about the Kim Kardashians of the world or whatnot. But in, in this case, it was people in the venture capital world, big names like Peter Thiel that, uh, you know, got the word out there, um, which really, you know, it's, it's an interesting interesting dynamic or, or an interesting reminder, really, Jim, just how powerful some voices can be and what you have to be thinking about when you're posting on social media. Yeah, without a doubt. I mean, you've got the Peter Thiels and other notable venture capitalists, and there's been a lot of criticism, we'll just say a venture capital more broadly, about, hey, why did you accelerate this panic? Why did you, you know, say that to your portfolio companies? Well, I think the answer is pretty obvious because SVB had made a bunch of bad bets and your money isn't safe there. So, um, but you're right, I, you know, the, the Peter Thiels of the world and the other VCs that have notable audiences, they do have outsized impact. And I think anybody who has a sizable audience on social media or any other platform should feel a sense of obligation to be responsible about that. And, you know, there'll be much written about whether the VCs were appropriately responsible, were they maybe self-interested in some ways, perhaps. Uh, but, you know, again, I, I keep coming back to in this particular circumstance, facts matter. And, and the fact of the matter is SVB had taken very, very unhealthy bets and was in a very difficult and, and over leveraged situation. So what, what should somebody as a depositor of SVB should have done? Should we have kept our money there? I don't think so. I think it's entirely justified. Do you think that there was some need for, for loyalty to this particular uh, firm because of, uh, you know, who they were lending to? You know, when you think about Silicon Valley Bank uh, funding, as uh, startups that might have had a hard time getting money elsewhere. Um, do you think that perhaps there there was, you know, a, a bit of a maybe there should have been a bit, bit more of a, a wait and see? I know that you just outlined the reasons why it shouldn't have been. But, you know, yeah. do, you've heard the argument about, you know, maybe this is a, a bit, uh, um, you know, inappropriate that that people didn't stick with the bank through this. You know, I, I'm a big fan of loyalty and I admire the sentiment behind that. But I, I personally feel loyalty to making payroll for my employees, right? And so literally that's what we're talking about. I'm going to be loyal and stand with my bank and take irresponsible, unhealthy risks with money that needs to go to make payroll. That does not seem like a wise choice for any CEO to make. So maybe you could argue that for the venture capitalists that, hey, you know, you, you have a whole portfolio of companies, but even that, the portfolio companies all have to make their own payroll. So I, I again, I admire the sentiment of loyalty. I think in this particular case, it would have been very misplaced and it would have been tragic if people had tried to stay loyal to a bank they had lost their money. They couldn't make payroll. As it turns out, the FDIC and the Fed bailed, you know, ba either bailed them out or just, you know, backstopped the financial system, depending on what term you want to use. Um, so it, it would have been okay. But there's not, uh, it's not hard to imagine a circumstance where things could have gone horribly wrong and literally companies aren't making payroll. I, I just think that's a terrible trade-off for any executive to make in, in an attempt to be loyal to their bank. Jim, what uh, do you think other banks potentially could learn from this other than the 
you know, the, the sort of need to, to hedge those uh, interest rate sensitive uh, investments. But, you know, just from the communication side of things and, you know, the, the speed at which this did spread on social media. Yeah, I think it's a great reminder that, you know, whatever you think is is happening and however long you have to respond to that, you probably don't have nearly as long as you think. I mean, we went from Silicon Valley Bank being not on anybody's mind on, you know, th say Thursday morning, Wednesday night, um, outside of a very narrow slice to the entire world talking about it Thursday and Friday. So 24 to, and, and then, you know, 24 hours later, they're, they're insolvent, right? So, you know, 48 hours from start to finish on the path to insolvency is probably a good lesson to take away if you're a bank. And so really honing your crisis communications and then uh, underpinning that. I mean, you don't need crisis communications if you can avoid the crisis. That's the whole idea right. of banks. We put our money in banks so that it'll be safe. I, I don't wake up in the morning trying to think about the security of my bank. I hope not to do that. It's usually a bad thing. So I but I, you're exactly right. I mean, it, it, the accelerant of social media is going to take any story and, and make it spread like wildfire. Jim, great to get your thoughts on this today. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for watching Morning Markets. We continue to see the markets under broad pressure. We tried to take our mind off of it with Andy Bell, but he kind of harshed us out with the talk of octopuses. Let's see what David George Kosh can do, because uh, you've been following the debut of this movie about BlackBerry, but I don't know if it's a... Um it's not a positive story either, is it? Well, it, it really is about the rise and fall of BlackBerry or Research in Motion, the company that came from a small Waterloo upstart company back in the mid-1990s that developed the BlackBerry, which uh, I have here. Well, one of my old BlackBerries, this is the BlackBerry. Does it still work? No, uh, if, it, if I charged it, I think it would still work, but it's my it's actually my wife's old BlackBerry. Look this, at this that. This BlackBerry Bold there. Throwback. And um, uh, there's a movie um, based on the book by uh, Sean Silkoff and Jackie McNish, former Global, uh, Jackie's a former Global Mail reporter, Sean's still there, uh, called Losing the Signal. Uh, and this book was made into a movie. And it's a bit of a uh, nostalgic trip on the heyday of BlackBerry and what exactly caused that company to uh, lose the smartphone wars to Apple uh, and uh, Google's Android devices. I had the opportunity to go behind the scenes. I spoke with Glenn Howerton. He's the actor uh, better known for It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Yeah. And he played Jim Ball Silly. And I got to say, it was a little bit of a trip to talk to someone that looked so remarkably he, like Ball Silly, like Jim, that it, even down to the class ring on his finger, the, the costume folks did a great job about that. Sorry, Andrew. I was just going to say, you interviewed him in character. In character. Well, he just came off yeah, from a yeah, scene yeah, yeah, and yeah. he was about to go do a scene. Cool. I talked to him about what really appealed to him about uh, why he decided to take on the role of Jim Ball Silly. Take a listen to what he had to say about that. It wasn't so much doing a movie about Blackberry that was interesting to me as much as is the, 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 the characters behind Blackberry, the people themselves and what drives them, what motivates them. Um, I'll admit I have a tendency to be attracted to larger than life characters, maybe that have a little bit of bluster and maybe there's a hint of narcissism there, you know, um, certainly a tremendous amount of ego. Uh, I'm just attracted to characters like that. I find, I find um, characters like that fascinating. Narcissism and ego, I'm certainly. I'm smiling at that because the stories that I have heard of Jim Balzilli in, in certain meetings um, sometimes have portrayed that. Now, that made me also wonder, like, did he get, how supportive is Jim of this movie? So word is he actually is a little bit on side okay. on this movie. I don't think he's seen the full thing. It's been actually uh, released, uh, uh, it, it had its premiere in the Berlin Film Festival and it's coming in uh, movie theaters across Canada in May. Um, there you see the, the trailer of this movie there. Um, but yeah, I, I think Jim's actually okay with this, but again, remains to be seen. He does come across as quite intense uh, uh, with Howerton's portrayal of him. Is that him. Mike Lazaridis? Uh, That's Mike Lazaridis, played by his... Jay Baruchel, yeah. uh, another Canadian actor. He's actually a Toronto native as well. That's Matt Johnson, who directed and wrote the script as well. Um, it, it, it's just a very fascinating take, and, and I d also have some uh, uh, images from behind the scenes. I was able to go on set and take some 
some uh, pictures. There's the uh, production studio, um, which, uh, and not a lot of people know this, my first job out of high school was working at Research in Motion on the production line. I was refurbishing the the, the pager type devices and and the scenes of, of the production facilities mirrors what actually took place wow. so uncannily. I think they actually got a lot of former Blackberry uh, uh, material there. There you see a lot of old uh, uh, Blackberry uh, batteries there as well there, Amber. It was a bit of a trip to go to this Hamilton set and really see behind the scenes I don't even remember there. that other logo, the, the Blackberry one. Um, any word of whether Blackberry today is supportive or, you know, whether they plan, whether John Chen plans to see them? <laughs> That's a great question. I actually don't know. I mean, they likely would. I mean, this is ultimately a, a story about the rise and fall. It's a, pr a yeah. positive Canadian story. I do want to throw one more clip of Mr. Howerton. I asked him, Was you? were you ever a BlackBerry user back in the past? Were you ever addicted? Were you a CrackBerry user? Here's what he had to say about that. Take a listen. There was no appeal for me to the BlackBerry because it was an email machine. That's what it was. It wasn't a browser. It wasn't, didn't have apps. You know what I mean? It was uh, initially, um, it, was a, it was an email machine. It was a texting machine. And I didn't, I, I still, to this day, I can't stand email. I hate email. I hate, I hate it all. I, I, want, I want people to leave me alone. Amber, I thought it was a little bit of a trip to see someone that looks like Jim Ball Silly say that he hated the BlackBerry or hated the BlackBerry at the time. But again, he's come around to it. He's now an iPhone user. He, he embraces email, he told me. So I thought that that was kind of an e interesting way of ending this particular segment. Well, credit to them. Kim Kardashian loved her BlackBerry and didn't want to give it up. And I think neither did Obama. Obama. I, th I think there's a lot of people out there that yeah. still hold still on to the keyboard, BlackBerry. Yeah. They still love the tactile keyboard, which you no longer can find in stores right now. It's all about the touchscreen devices, which is something BlackBerry tried and failed. All right, thank you very much, David George Kosh. We'll look forward to that. And there's a big write-up on our website about what it was like to go behind the scenes. Check it out on bnnbloomberg.ca.